Namaste, my name is Amish Tripathi and I am the director of the Nehru Centre London. Now, some may think of Nehru Centre as just this beautiful fine building and it is a fine building no doubt. We have a wonderful art gallery out here, we have an awesome auditorium on the first floor with a capacity of 100 to 120 people right here in the heart of central London in Mayfair. But the Nehru Centre is a lot more than this fine building. The Nehru Centre is also an online platform. We are available on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram and on YouTube. And so the Nehru Centre is actually wherever you want it to be. Of course we'd love for you to come uh, to the physical events uh, that we organise out here uh, when we do organise them. But to join all our online platforms as well, this is a hybrid world. We are going to have offline physical events and online events uh, as well. So do join our online platforms uh, and do keep giving us feedback of uh, uh, what you think of it. We'd love to host you out there. We'd love to hear what you think of our events and do keep sending in your suggestions as well. We do keep uh, imbibing and uh, learning from the feedback that you give to us to give you programs that you guys might enjoy. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Namaste. Jai Hind. Namaste. Happy Republic Day to all of you. Gartanta Divas ke bohat bohat shubkam na hai. 2022 is a landmark year for India. Of course, it is the 75th year of our existence as an independent uh, country. But this year, I mean, projections show very clearly that uh, at the end of March uh, 2022, uh, India's GDP will cross uh, the GDP of our former colonial master, the UK. I'm sitting in London, UK, and our GDP will cross uh, the UK's GDP as of March 2022. What we lost over a few centuries, we've recovered just within 30 years of uh, economic of post-economic reforms. The next 25 years will be even more exciting. Projections are that by the end of this decade, we should certainly cross uh, Germany and uh, Japan to become the third largest uh, economy. All these uh, th these economic changes will of course have an impact on uh, India's social life, political life, uh, foreign relations and we couldn't have put together a better uh, panel uh, than the one that's coming up right now to discuss uh, these very exciting and uh, uh, world-changing uh, uh, events that will that will happen over the next 25 years. So if I may invite uh, the guest that we have uh, for you first, Amrita Narlikar, uh, who is President Giga, non-resident senior fellow at the ORF. Namaste, Amrita. Namaste. Pleasure having you here. Uh, then Rajeshwari Pillai, Rajgopalan, Director, Center for Security and Strategy and Technology at the ORF. Namaste, Rajeshwari ji. Pleasure having you on uh, stage with us. Good to be here. Uh, Ambassador Navdeep Suri, Distinguished Fellow, ORF and uh, Senior uh, Retired IFS Officer. Uh, I had met him as an ambassador uh, of the UAE. Pleasure having you here, Navdeep ji. Pleasure. Uh, C. Raja Mohan, uh, Visiting Professor, Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore, uh, a doyan in the uh, foreign policy space. It's an honor having you uh, on our platform, Raja ji. Thank you, Amish, for inviting me here. Thank you. Uh, and Adil Zainul Bhai, Chairman at Capacity Building Commission of India and Quality Council of India. Adil ji, thank you so much for uh, facing us. Pleasure. And uh, to conduct these uh, all these uh, proceedings, uh, my partner in crime, Samir Saran, President of <laughs> Foundation India, who you've seen on our platform on a few occasions. Samir, thank you so much uh, for uh, conducting this event for us. So, Amish, uh, thank you so much for uh, your partnership. It's always a pleasure to uh, work with the Nehru Center and put together conversations that in many ways uh, agitate our own progress. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, the next 25 years beckon us. As we celebrate 75 years of independence, as we mark our Republic Day today, ORF put together a series of essays to uh, explore various aspects of the Indian story, looking back and looking ahead. Uh, this compilation is available online, and I would request all our viewers to go and uh, uh, read these uh, wonderful essays written by some of the finest minds uh, uh, today. And uh, these uh, are cross-cutting. They look uh, in words. They look at the Indian economic story, uh, human development aspects, uh, the climate stories, 
the geopolitical aspects and how we engage with others. It also looks at um, the digital India and uh, frontiers such as space and, and emerging technology. And I, I think this is election uh, in many ways is just the beginning of conversations India must have with itself and with others as it charts out its next 25 years, which are really going to be exciting. And to discuss all of this, uh, I think we had some of those authors with us, um, a, a very fine panel, uh, uh, and you've already introduced them, Amish, so I will quickly move into the conversation so that we can get the maximum out of uh, this evening. And let me first uh, turn to uh, Adil Zenolbhai, uh, who, besides uh, wearing many hats that you have listed, is also someone who has been deeply engaged with India's evolution over the past three to four decades in various roles. And I want to ask you, sir, that in your essay that you have written for us, you have stated that digital India today means different things to different people. But for the world, it means that India with its technology is here to lead. And my question to you would be that which India do you refer to? Is it the India of the unicorns? And we see this huge um, startup ecosystem emerging? Is it the India which is changing its life through technology? Is it governance that... Where do you see digital India mediate our future? Uh, Sameer, thank you so much. And it's a, it's a great question because it covers so much ground. <coughs> so let me start out with saying that, uh, you know, digital India has really taken off in the last few years uh, because the infrastructure for a digital India was laid. So today, 99% uh, of the villages in India have a 4G connectivity. So if you are a farmer, except in the 1% of the villages, which will get there soon, uh, for the first time, you have access to the world in a way that you didn't have before. You can buy a 5,000 rupee phone and soon it'll be a 2,000 rupee phone that will have about 70 to 80% of the capability of an iPhone. And on that, in your own language, you can get access to the world uh, and you can learn, you can transact, you can do whatever it is that you want to do, just as the richest denizens of the world can do. So the time gap between what other people can get and what the poorest person in India can get has shrunk. And because the world is so much happens digitally, as opposed through physical goods, a very large proportion of the Indian population is getting access to it as a result of the digital infrastructure that has been laid by this incredible push to get uh, 4G connectivity and broadband connectivity to every village and every individual in India. So that is, so the first point is that without that infrastructure, there would be no digital India, right? So we have to have that infrastructure. Then on top of that, I want to talk about two or three aspects uh, and then we can continue that dialogue later. I won't go on for too long. The first aspect is that uh, India now has been able to develop what I call population scale platforms at startup speed. Uh, mm -hmm. In the past, we always thought the government would move very slowly, but the scale of our issues are so big and that's why we call it population scale, but at startup speed. And let me give you a few examples of these which are leading edge platforms for the world. Of course, the first one where, the, where we showed this uh, was Aadhaar and now everyone's familiar with it, so I won't, need, I won't go into it. But very recently we've had UPI, which is the uh, interface for transactions, for financial transactions. Uh, India currently has over $150 billion worth of transactions happening on that. Uh, we have more transactions on that uh, compared to any country other than China. And in a very short period of time, this platform uh, has allowed uh, digital transactions to take off in India in a huge way. It was designed in India, it's run by Indians, it is a population scale program at startup speed. Uh, if you look at how Coven was developed, Coven was developed in India, uh, it now has over 750 million people on it. It is probably one of the best, uh, uh, it's the best platform to track uh, Coven uh, vaccines uh, and soon it will also be able to track tests, etc. India developed it and we did this in record time. If you look at our national digital health mission, same kinds of things are happening. If you look at the portal called eShram, eShram current, the goal is to have 400 million people who are laborers in India 
registered on eShram and they will be away. All government benefits would then mm. flow through that digitally without touching, you know, without going through any local uh, administration, etc. So all of a sudden, uh, I would say in the last few years, we've got enormous confidence that mm. in India we can build population scale programs at digital, at startup speed. So we don't have to take 10 years to build it. We can build it in six months and get it launched. Uh, and I, you know, there are four or five other such big uh, population scale programs that are about to be launched that were all developed in India using open standards, using Indian programming talent, and they will be available to the rest of the world, which is very interested in getting something like this. If you look at, uh, Amish, I think you are in the UK, you said. If you look at the amount of money that the UK spent in putting the track and trace software program in place, Coven was built for one hundredth of that cost. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so that's the second part of the digital. That's the second part of the digital piece that I wanted to uh, <coughs> uh, talk about. And the third part, so that we don't forget about our wonderful unicorns, is mm -hmm. that over a fifteen-year period, the startup ecosystem in India has changed dramatically. And today, it is sort of the largest startup ecosystem after, I would say, the U.S. and China. Uh, there are more unicorns in India than any of other country except those two. Uh, then, uh, you know, next year we will have another 30 to 40 more. The amount of venture capital money that's coming into these companies is huge. Every, every student who, but more importantly, every student who graduates today is looking forward to this and saying, I want to do, you know, if these guys can do it, I can build something. So it is creating an excitement amongst people. Uh, to go and start their own business and make it successful. 60, 50% uh, of the unicorns that are coming out now have come out from regional engineering colleges or state colleges. They are not from the IITs and the IIMs. And, and more of them are going to come from there. More of them are coming from tier three and tier four towns. So this is a quick overview of digital. Sorry for taking so long, but I want to cover all three areas. No, I think it is very important. Uh, the key message from you is uh, the connectivity and information space now is truly democratic and deep. Uh, financial inclusion is now a reality. And uh, of course, uh, a platform scale governance delivery is, is something that we are witnessing in India in recent past. Uh, I will come back to you for a second round of question and I want to leave a thought with you. And I want you to wear your management hat and help uh, design the future. Uh, uh, there is also a population scale expectation from government. If everyone is connected, everyone has aspirations, everyone has ambitions, and therefore the pressure on government is likely to increase when more people want to engage with it. And wearing your management hat, looking ahead, what are some of the key governance ideas that we must build into our system to serve the next 25 years of the India story? Let me turn to Raji at this stage. Uh, Raji, uh, uh, Dr. Rajeshwi Rajagopalan, uh, director of uh, center at ORF that focuses on uh, technology and security and, of course, strategy. Uh, Raji, your paper uh, speaks of India's uh, bridging <coughs> in the technology domain. But before I uh, ask you to explain that Indian role for technology and uh, for, for the emerging world, let me ask you, how exciting is the space sector, the outer space sector? That's another India story of the last uh, decade or so. And while we see these multi-billionaires that take a, a walk down the outer orbit, uh, what does it really mean for a country like us? No, uh, thank you, Samir. And uh, it's uh, it's an exciting time uh, in terms of when you look at space, space tourism, like you said, space mining, uh, new lunar missions are being planned, increasing private sector, not just in the Western context. Uh, private sector was a typically a Western phenomenon, but that's also changing in the last uh, a decade or so. Uh, the Asian countries, whether it is India, China, uh, Japan has been somewhat more pro in this regard. So all of us are uh, getting more excited about what you can do in space, what you can uh, get out of space in a sense. And I think there are also uh, many more countries, especially the developing countries in Asia, are beginning to just appreciate the uh, utility of space and how change uh, space can change the lives of the people 
So uh, safe spaces become so important for the <clears throat> social economic development, but also for the security uh, security uh, uh, requirements in a sense increasingly. So I think space is become has become come to become the uh, centerpiece in that sense uh, in terms of uh, st uh, strategy and technology development and so on and so forth. But I think uh, there are also many challenges, including for India, uh, whether it is in terms of space governance, whether in terms of the domestic policy network, uh, but also in terms of the global governance debates uh space deb debris that the amount of junk that we are creating uh, over the or have created over the decades i think that's an important problem that we have to deal with and if you continue to use space in the manner in which we are doing some of the especially the weaponization trends that we are seeing we may not be able to use space in uh, in in a in the longer term or even in the medium term, actually, a day without space is something that we need to think about. And especially in the context of the repeated anti-satellite tests that countries have been doing, uh, we ourselves have done one a decade, almost uh, uh, three, four years, uh, three years ago now. But that was, in a sense, we had to demonstrate that capability three years ago when India conducted the Mission Shakti, its own anti-satellite test. That was, in a sense, to uh, we were trying to match up to a capability that already exists in the region. Uh, China's. Uh, so from our perspective, I think the major problems are in terms of what China is doing, uh, what are the <clears throat> what are the strategic consequences of the uh, China's space program? Uh, of course, otherwise, uh, uh, the China's development of the anti-satellite test was the first major wake-up call for India in terms of the challenges that India needs to be prepared to. But the, some of the other challenges that go somewhat unnoticed are the cyber uh, and electronic warfare in space, uh, development of directed energy weapons. These are the kind of things that really don't get much attention. But at the same time, this is becoming... Uh, uh, in a sense, the more preferred way of uh, attacking somebody else's satellites or creating disruptions. Because if you're using a cyber weapon uh, to create a satellite, a satellite disruption, it is going to create only a temporary damage and therefore uh, countries may not pursue a sort of a, um, a sort of a case against you and so on and so forth so in a sense those are uh, so so far china has been doing something of this kind uh, against uh, primarily against the us but i think this is something that india needs to be concerned about and in fact i think india is mindful of this uh, this particular challenges that is coming about to the point where the uh, um, DRDO, the Devel uh, research, uh, Defense Research and Development Organization chief, went on to say that we are also developing a slew of the uh, counter space capabilities in order to protect our satellites because we are so invested. Uh, if you were to calculate the kind of uh, economic investment, including the ground infrastructure and the services associated with it, we have something to the tune of 30, uh, 35, 37 uh, billion uh, invested in this. So uh, we are socially and economically, and of course, security wise, invested in space. and Therefore, protecting our space assets uh, are, is an important task, and I think that's going to drive our policy network. But I think from an Indian perspective, I think we are also facing increasingly um, a sort of a capacity deficit. Uh, ISRO has done very well in terms of the, especially given the minuscule budget that we work with. Uh, it, it's a Chandrayaan mission uh, a decade, more than a decade ago. Uh, you had the Mangalyaan mission, India's Mars mission, all of which have been very, very successful and especially at a fraction of the cost which we have done that. But I think given the kind of growing demands that we are seeing, there is a huge demand and, and, and supply is a sort of, so there, has, there has been some sort of constraints on that front. And I think therefore, I think we have to open up the private sector. And I think that's something that we are seeing over the last two years. The government has spoken about the uh, opening of the private, uh, to the private sector, the Indian space sector, so that uh, uh, private players can actually contribute to India's space story. Otherwise, we will be losing out, not only because we will not be able to keep up with our growing demand, but we're also going to uh, sort of be losing out in the global commercial space market. So if India has to catch, uh, get a sizable chunk of the global space market, we have to step up our act, particularly uh, by bringing in the private sector. And it's India so is... Uh, yes. So you're making a case for private sector, you're making a case for using the... Uh, entrepreneurial uh, energy of India uh, to uh, to deepen our engagement in the sector. Quick question to you. You state that we need to play a bridging role that can, in a sense, uh, narrow the gap between the developing countries and the developed world. Now, uh, in, in strategic sectors, we have seen more recently, India prefers to play with the 
cord it is not necessarily becoming uh, the leader of the trade union it is it is taking a more uh, 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 yeah. you know strategic uh, role how can india do this in the space sector how do you see yeah. india uh yeah absolutely so india is a country that i think many developing countries have looked at with a lot of admiration because they see as a fellow democratic country that has been developing uh, uh, at a slow pace but at the same time have been able to make uh, significant scientific achievements whether in, in india's nuclear program or in india's uh, space program and so on and so forth so india therefore i think has a, uh, has certain amount of advantages and it has been attempting to do this play uh, play this kind of bridging role uh, but seriously, I think there are growing challenges. I think uh, I think the bridging the divide between the developing and the rich countries will become difficult, particularly because China China will try to exploit these differences. Also, uh, China is also step trying to step into the same shoe and trying to um, sort of uh, reach out to these developing countries and creating. So that this is a dividing line in the emerging cold uh, sort of cold war in a sense. India is in some ways well positioned in uh, because as a developing country, but India is also a rising power so we have our feet in both camps uh but yeah i think india also has to worry about its own security concerns so there is therefore, a... therefore i think it will uh, in some sense it'll limit our maneuverability in some sense uh but i think uh because be driven by the security concerns we are moving closer to the quad countries and kind of things but at the same time uh we have this aspiration we have this ambition to partner with developing countries so that we can also we share don't our do it, we'll leave a vacuum for china i think that's the case you're making that we will yes. have to think of this as a strategic imperative on our end to, to to work with the, the emerging we world. have done some ways that uh, 2014 for instance for the first time india talked about the south asian satellite uh mm -hmm. having been a South space power for a long time for several decades we de never did Thought, think about uh, we never really thought about what we can do for the neighboring countries and kind of things but so at least now we have begun to kind of the space diplomacy bit is coming uh, from uh, approaching this from a strategic perspective excellent, excellent. so so uh, thank you Raji uh, and I'll come back to you uh, uh, Amrita let me turn to you Professor Narlikar uh, I have uh, you know you have been writing on multilateralism you've been writing on global governance you've been writing on uh, the challenges we face for uh, Forever, I've been reading your work uh, and I've been inspired by your writings. Now, uh, one of your trains uh, uh, of thought uh, expressed in the essay that you have written for this volume, Aspiration, Ambition and Approaches, India at 75, which is on the screen for the viewers, uh, you suggest that uh, amidst all the hand-wringing, hand it's often forgotten that the crisis of multilateralism could offer new opportunities that India should harness. Uh, what could be these opportunities and what must India do? And as a follow-up, for example, we are seeing uh, 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 the European Union uh, become a new er arena of contest and conflict again. Now, in this situation that is emerging and fast evolving, what role could India be doing to strengthen uh, stability or to work towards uh, a, a global uh, entente uh, in this situation? Okay, thank you very much, Samir. Excellent questions as as always. And may I just say it's a great pleasure to be to be here with you and to be a part of this excellent co collection, very timely collection of essays. And uh, also thank you to Amish for hosting us. So, what are the opportunities, and what uh, what should India do to harness these opportunities in relation to this crisis of multilateralism that we are seeing? And there is indeed a crisis, right? You, you sort of we had uh, President Biden telling us America's back. We had Chancellor Merkel last year saying the prospects for multilateralism are much better than they have been since the last two years. But we know this relief was premature. Right. It was extremely premature, in fact, because we've seen uh, we have seen the tragedy unfolding in Afghanistan, which is a painful reminder of the failures of multilateralism and missing American leadership. You yourself, Samir, have written about the sins of omission and commission of the World Health Organization in the World Trade Organization. One of the areas that one of the organizations that I study, we're seeing countries still bickering. Over um, over trips and other and other aspects relating to vaccine access, even while COVID is spreading and continues to spread, so multilateralism really is not in the best of health. Um, and really, there are two big problems with it. One, we're facing a, a much tougher structural con context, which is driven by geoeconomics. 
So the entire post-war multilateral system was built on the assumption that peace and prosperity were inextricably and positively linked. In fact, we know that is now, as it turns out, that's not the case because we are seeing that countries are able to weaponize those chains of interdependence that were supposed to lead to prosperity and peace, in fact, can be weaponized for strategic purposes, for security purposes. And we, we saw this happening in the context of vaccine diplomacy, um, in the context of uh, countries uh, restricting exports of key medical supplies, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. We're seeing this in the case of semiconductor chips and so forth, rare earth minerals. There's a whole variety of materials which we know are very important for production and that and those value chains can be weaponized. And that's the first big problem of multilateralism. The system as we have it does not work with those assumptions. The system assumes that you have peace and prosperity and they'll go hand in hand together. So more interdependence is a good thing and it might not be. The second problem is values, right? It's this assumption that we can somehow just tinker with multilateralism, just come up with very technocratic solutions on how do we change decision-making processes? Can we, make, can, we, can, we, can we do something about fishery subsidies? Yes, fishery subsidies are extremely important, but we don't ask the question, what is the very purpose of multilateralism? So that's the big crisis. But a crisis is also an opportunity. And India would do well to harness this opportunity for itself, but also for the global community at large. And so let me just give you three important opportunities. First, India has always made the case for reforming multilateralism, right? It's talked about how inequitable some of the processes are, um, how the outcomes turn out to be uh, rather skewed, uh, how developing countries don't have enough voice and are not able to get uh, and are not able to influence outcomes. Uh, now, for the first time, we are seeing a much more serious debate on reform taking place, uh, not just a box ticking exer exercise, because multilateralism looks pretty broken. And there is recognition amongst multiple parties that reform needs to be to be undertaken. India could play a leading role in this reform process. Second, the great and the good, the powerful players in the multilateral system, be it the P5, be it the Quad, the old Quad in the, in the World Trade Organization, um, there is increasing recognition that there is a need for allies. And this is especially so in the West, right? You, you, you we, I think we saw, I think that might have been the last time we saw each other physically, which was at the Munich Security Conference in 2020, where there was this deep soul searching about Westlessness. There is a real concern about Westlessness and the need for allies to look beyond the obvious and to look at other players in other regions. And India, I would argue, is a potentially extremely important ally, both for the US and the European Union. And third, India has always had uh, uh, a circumspect approach to globalization, right? India has done very well out of trade liberalization, out of its uh, uh, different parts of a liberalization process, um, but it has always been very critical of rampant globalization. And we saw this play out, for example, in the debate on food security in the World Trade Organization, right? Now, because of weaponized interdependence, because of geoeconomics, India, India's approach looks much more meaningful than it had done in the past. Mm -hmm. So for these three reasons, I would argue that India, there are these opportunities and India is uniquely placed to harness them. And, and uh, what should India be doing today uh, with what's happening in Europe? Uh, you know, with this new face off that's underway, what would be your uh, advice to Indian policymakers on what India should be thinking about doing? Well, as I'm sitting here in Germany, and may, perhaps I could say just one thing about Germany. And because Germany, as you know, has been subject to quite a lot of critique uh, mm -hmm. on what's been happening in Ukraine uh, and the new. Yeah. And, and, and there's also been there's a lot of debate within Germany on how to deal with China. Right. And so here I would argue that these two points that I've just made on the crisis of multilateralism, one, 
there is a problem of reliability of supply chains. And this is why, this is one big reason why Germany has been more cautious than a, let, than a lot of other European countries on how to deal with the problems that are emerging in relation to Ukraine and Russia, right? And that has to do with energy dependence. Um, and, and so Germany should be doing, taking a long, hard look at its supply chains. And the same goes with China, right? You have a big business lobby that here that says, well, actually, that's how we've that's how we've developed our business, our production lines. We don't want to stop trading with China. You see this in some of the big autom automobile sectors, right? So Germany needs to be needs to be at the forefront of these global supply chains and restruct restructuring them. And that's not the language you normally hear in Germany. At best, you hear is diversification, right? right? And then the second point is values, right? Germany loves to talk about values, but often this is limited to labor standards, environmental standards, which are important, right? But there are also macro level values like democracy and pluralism and the liberal order that Germany supposedly really believes in, right? And both China and Russia are challenging this. So Germany should be, take, should, should be taking a long, hard look again on the values that it's that it claims to promote and then do something about this. This is where India comes in on both these fronts, right? Mm -hmm. Because India is a great potential partner as for trade purposes, absolutely, but also in the bigger scheme of things in terms of geopolitics, in terms of global governance issues, right? And so here for India, I would say, we have always said we want to be pragmatic. In, now I'm saying we as India, right, as, as an Indian. So this, these are my multiple identities that may be a little bit confusing even to me. But um, as Indians, we tend to say, oh, we're being very pragmatic. Now we don't want to be ideological, right? And then we often find ourselves in the China camp, right? In the WTO, often we're working very closely with China. Whereas what we should be doing is we should be very proud of the values that, that we uphold. And those values are indeed democracy and rule of law and, um, and human rights and so on and so forth. Right. And so and and this is not to say that any system is perfect or any democracy is perfect. Right. Germany also has its problems. So different Hungary EU, EU members have their problems. So does India. But both values and secure supply chains are those two areas where India should be fairly proactive in working with Europe. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Marlikar, uh, and I'll be back uh, with another question and another round of questions for you. But let me turn to Ambassador uh, Nabib Suri. Uh, and Ambassador Suri, uh, you heard uh, our first three uh, speakers uh, list uh, some of the uh, aspects of India's emergence uh, from technology to space to uh, con concerns around security, supply chains, trade and uh, geographies. Uh, let me read out uh, a, a, a statement uh, in the essay written by Prime Minister Stephen Harper for this collection. Uh, and one statement that you have written in your essay, and then I'm going to ask you about those uh, two statements. The first statement that Prime Minister Harper writes in his essay, that modern India has put a lie to the notion that democratic governance and economic progress are incompatible with extreme social diversity and high initial level of poverty. Uh, you in your essay say, that uh, the positions taken by India on new areas of economic diplomacy will be followed closely, not only by India's competitors, but also by its allies in the developing world. Now, what is the India story that you have shared with the world in your career over many, many decades? And what is the new story that is emerging as we look ahead uh, in the next 25 years? What is India's new economic diplomacy architecture? Okay, so that's a very large question, but let me uh, try to wrap my head around it. Uh, you know, when it comes to economic diplomacy, I guess part of the uh, thing to build on the uh, uh, points that made, were made by uh, Professor Raji and Professor uh, Amrita Nilkar, um, the Indian aid model is being uh, looked at very carefully by a lot of countries. Uh, the Indian Development Partnership model uh, is getting a lot of attention. And the reason is we are not China, uh, which means that the kind of criticism that is uh, associated with the Chinese development partnership model, uh, where you have the debt trap diplomacy, you have the resource grab, uh, you have uh, money flowing into the Swiss bank accounts of select leaders, you have the undermining of governance systems. 
um, you have a, a pretty cavalier attitude towards uh, environmental concerns and uh, uh, to top it all, there have been uh, serious allegations about uh, use of prison labor in some Chinese uh, funded projects in Africa that I've uh, heard of. Um, so it, it's no wonder that, uh, you know, Chinese assistance becomes uh, an election issue in Zambia or even today, as we speak, the railway line that they've uh, built in, uh, Nairo, in uh, Kenya, uh, its viability is in question, but should the uh, Kenyans be unable to pay back the loan, uh, Mombasa port's ownership could be at stake. So you can understand that the kind of concern uh, that uh, the aggressive Chinese uh, uh, debt diplomacy uh, is uh, provoking. Uh, now, when you talk to African leaders, uh, and that's what I mentioned by some of our allies in the developing uh, world, they uh, say, well, where's the choice? Um, we used to get Western aid, but that has diminished and that is increasingly tied up with conditionalities and the Chinese at least do build the infrastructure. Now, India comes in here at a very interesting point because uh, uh, while we are much smaller in uh, dollar figures than the Chinese, but we are not insubstantial anymore. Our lines of credit are more than $10 billion to Africa. We offer 12,000 uh, uh, trading slots a year. And I think the focus that we place on capacity building, the focus that we pay, uh, place on host countries taking ownership of the uh, uh, of the development projects when we set up an it center in ghana or in uh, tanzania or somewhere else part of the model is that we will not run it for more than five years from the third year or fourth year onwards the master trainers would be in place and they would have done enough capacity building with local trainers uh, for us to hand over the project for them to them uh, uh, for running it and that's such a big contrast with what the Chinese are doing or what the others are doing. The dollar value uh, for money that our, uh, our assistance projects provide, I think is, is, is again, one of those attractive propositions. And that's why uh, I think uh, as we go forward, uh, countries like Japan and UK and even UAE are, are talking to India about trilateral uh, uh, assistance programs where uh, we can combine, uh, join hands with them and perhaps deliver much more effective aid. Now, I'm not saying that our systems are perfect. I think there's a long ways to go. Uh, there's much that we can do to uh, bridge the delivery gap. But the good news is that we are getting better at it. And, and I think as we, uh, as we get better, uh, we're going to see uh, uh, that the Indian model perhaps is, is seen with a much uh, greater level of uh, interest. You know, on, 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 on uh, Prime Minister Harper's observation about uh, uh, democracy and uh, uh, growth, I think we have demonstrated over the uh, last uh, uh, three decades in particular that uh, uh, a democracy can grow uh, occasionally at a fairly rapid clip, occasionally uh, uh, with the fit and fits and starts. But I think uh, you know, in my conversations, I've often had to explain when, when people used to ask, uh, uh, why doesn't India do things faster or more efficiently or more effectively? Uh, uh, I think you have to explain that, you know, given the system, uh, legal systems that we have and given the democratic systems that we have, the parliamentary processes and the federal structure, we perhaps do end up paying a bit of a democracy tax. Uh, um, and, and But despite paying the democracy tax, if we can still manage to grow at the speed that uh, Amish was referring to, that we would be the world's third largest economy in a few years' time, uh, that's not doing so badly. So there's some uh, lessons in that for perhaps other countries. So let me ask you uh, something uh, that Amrita mentioned in her intervention, uh, the importance of values and democracy. Uh, and I think uh, there has been there has been some change in the recent years. And do you believe that we are more confident of using the D word in our diplomatic engagements, and we are uh, more confident of pushing forward our own values framework? We are now, in many ways, setting norms on certain kinds of transactions. Do you see this change in your span, career span? I have seen a change, but I'd be very careful in uh, how I use it. Um, I, I, I think we've done well by not being prescriptive to uh, our friends in the developing world. Uh, I think we've done well uh, by uh, leading by example rather than by being uh, prescriptive. Uh, about 
We've helped uh, build electoral uh, institutions in a number of countries. We've helped develop constitutions in a number of countries. Uh, uh, but we've done it uh, fairly gently. Uh, and, and I think that has uh, worked well for us. So I would uh, certainly uh, be very careful about uh, talking up an Indian uh, value system. I think let our example speak for itself, uh, and, and I'd be much more comfortable with that. It's so more by attraction, less by promotion. Um, and I think that's the uh, Ambassador Suri mantra for engaging on a values and, and pluralism framework with our neighbors and with our partners in the emerging world. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Uh, Raja Mohan, who's of course, I think uh, the, the tallest figure in our foreign policy uh, community. And uh, I, I kept you for the last, uh, because you would have heard all of them by now. Uh, and I am going to actually pick up two lines that I read in two different essays in this publication. One was by uh, Harsh Pant, uh, where he says, India is shedding its past diffidence in foreign policy matters and is making bold moves in crafting partnerships for a rules-based democratic international order. The operating word, shedding its past diffidence in foreign policy. You argue, in fact, you extend this by suggesting that as a major beneficiary of economic globalization, India must actively prevent the breakdown of the international order and must do more. And having heard all of the previous speakers, what would you be the Professor Raja Mohan mantra for India over the next 25 years? What bothers you with what's happening around us? And what could be India's choices at this particular moment? Thanks, Amit. I think uh, uh, what you said about, you know, the diffidence, that's absolutely true. And the source of that uh, is lies in what Amish, Amish said in the beginning. The faster economic growth of India in the last three decades has meant India's relative weight in the international system has significantly increased. So fifth or sixth largest economy today. Uh, yesterday, the IMF report uh, talks about uh, India's growing at 9% next year and 8 the following year. If we stick to that rate, if even 7%, I mean, I think uh, India would be in a much, much better position uh, down the road uh, by the end of this decade. Uh, I think in the past, uh, as Harsh talked about diffidence, we were playing cricket on the back foot when you're batting. Uh, afraid of what the world will do to us, therefore protecting yourself from the rest of the world, uh, shrinking your options. That was what strategic autonomy non-alignment uh, was. But today, as our weight grows, uh, our challenge is to really shape the international system, that you have the capacity to shape the international system and also tilt the balance between the other powers. So I think you have the capability today to do that. That is batting on the front foot. So I think that is the change. And I think we're beginning to see the consequences of this. But as we talk about India rising, we must also keep in mind India's per capita income will be pretty low for a long time to come. Therefore, even as India becomes a great power, its internal challenges of internal development, of uh, generating prosperity for everyone will remain a big one. Uh, just as China has had that problem, uh, India too will have that problem. We are much, much down below. I think we should never forget that, the importance of uh, further development and better distribution with that. Uh, in terms of the international economic system, I think we're already at a phase, uh, Amrita talked about it. The old mantra of globalization has broken down. Mm -hmm. uh, that we don't want, you know, the US has walked out, you know, for all practical purposes. China has weaponized the international economic system. So I think we have to work with our friends and partners to find a way in which uh, reforming the existing trade system, not either keep saying globalization works for everyone, it doesn't. Therefore, finding a way to keep the core essence of the uh, globalization process while adapting to change. So I think selective globalization. We're already seeing that India is negotiating free trade agreements with some of its partners. I think that's the beginning, but the system has to be itself reformed. So my sense is India is put in a critical position today of both reordering the great power system by amidst the emerging confrontation between US and China, uh, reforming the multilateral system that uh, Amrita talked about it, uh, and then the uh, the, the question of uh, uh, rearranging the economic order. All three, I think, uh, for the first time, we're in a position to contribute rather than standing apart and complaining. I mean, there was a story in the old days, uh, scholars of Indian foreign policy would say, we were always on the sidelines shouting, you know, offside, offside, offside. Uh, but we're in the field today. 
uh, we got elbows. Uh, I think we need to dribble the ball and we need to take the lead. And I think that is a big change. So for this generation of Indian scholars, of Indian policy makers, this is really an exciting time. I mean, one way we shed our diffidence and we step out and, and play the game rather than uh, this holding back, always afraid uh, to, to step out. So, uh, you know, I asked Amrita this question and uh, she was quite, uh, 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 you know, specific in what we could be doing at this particular time. But let me ask you that same question. What's happening in Europe today? Uh, how should India be responding to uh, the face-off that we are witnessing uh, uh, around Ukraine? Look, I think there are two outcomes possible. I mean, I'm still an optimist. A deal is still possible. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think... Uh, at this point, I mean, um, Putin is not just doing this just to, you know, go for a big blast because he'll be as much, he'll lose as much by simply, you know, going into a war. And for the U.S., I think Biden has made it clear, look, Russia has to be respected. Russia has to be accommodated. If you go back to his press conference in June, uh, at the end of the summit with Putin, he's saying that, look, unlike his predecessors who dismissed Russia as a declining power, he said, look, we need Russia. We'll work with Russia, uh, given uh, the the importance for, of Russia for the European security. So I think there is a new realism about Russia in Washington. But unfortunately, they have to work this out in the middle through a crisis. Uh, so I think we'll see a couple of more twists. Uh, there'll be probably some more high-level summits. But in terms of rearranging the European security order is a necessity. The three great orders that were created in Europe, uh, 1919, 1945, and 1991, uh, none of them has endured. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, today, I think uh, Russia has to be integrated into the European security order. Russia was part of the European great power system mm -hmm. till 1970, when the Bolshevik revolution took place. And ever since then, Russia was sought to be excluded uh, from the arrangements. And Russia's hope in 91 that they'll be welcomed in, that, that didn't turn out to be true. So therefore, I think the, the big question is, how do you integrate Russia into a European uh, security order? And I think uh, there... Uh, Americans, for the first time, I think, are thinking positively. But the problem, of course, is Europe is divided, deeply divided. Uh, any accommodation with Russia, you'll see howls of protests in Poland, in the Balts, and various other countries. Uh, so, therefore, I think the internal contradictions of Europe. I think for a long time we saw Europe as a settled place, as a coherent place, or a divided, you know, between East and West. Uh, Europe has geopolitics, deep internal conflicts. Uh, I think we're beginning to see that for the first time, uh, again, coming back into play. Therefore, my sense is there's a big moment for Europe. If they play it right, you can have a new settlement, which include Russia in the future order, and that will work for everyone because a collapse of that order and a confrontation with Russia is going to make life a lot more miserable for us in Asia uh, because uh, a US-Russia confrontation in Europe uh, is going to give a free hand for China uh, and a whole lot of other consequences uh, would certainly follow, besides the immediate incentive of how they're going to deal with Taiwan. So, uh, Dr. Rajamoon, I'm going to come back to you for the final word. I would like you to uh, use the last two minutes to share two or three ideas for all of us to consider as we close. So I, I'll just stay with us and I'll be back with you. Let me turn back to uh, Adil and actually um, uh, go back to the question I asked him. Uh, with uh, so much excitement around technology, uh, so much connectivity, aspirations being fulfilled and being fueled in, in other instances, the burden of governance is certainly more. Uh, what are the governance innovations that we must be thinking about for the next 20 years? Uh, so I wanted to uh, plant an idea and then I'll give some concrete examples. Today, we are talking about a big step forward, which is citizen-centric governance. Right, which is the governance that uh, you know uh, is focused on the citizen, and you know over a twenty or thirty year period, we might in fact see something like uh, you know governance centric citizens, you know where <laughs> citizens play a very important role in governance because they have access to everything, and they can interface with everything, uh, and therefore instead of talking about citizen centric governance, we might talk about governance centric citizens. Uh, that they'll take a while to go, but let me at least talk about. Let me at least plan the idea. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Uh, on, on many fronts, including direct benefits transfer, uh, the citizens' interaction with the government has changed quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, most interactions of the citizen with the government used to be through their local, state, district, police uh, forces. And you know, whenever they wanted to get anything from the government, they had to go to an intermediary. 
and work with that intermediary to either get money that they are owed, scholarships that they need, payments from contract, payments for work that was done, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now, I think with the technology as it works, uh, you know, much of that interaction goes directly with the government digitally. And, mm -hmm. you know, one example, and then when it doesn't work, we hear from them uh, very fast. Let me give you an example. Uh, today, uh, if you look at the PM's uh, 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 portal for grievances, it gets over 100,000 complaints or grievances a month. Uh, and in a sense, the fact that it's going up, the numbers is very good because people believe that if they can approach the government directly, something will get done. There is a very elaborate system on ensuring that any grievance that comes is actually dealt with and that, in fact, there is a response to the citizen. And if you broaden that out, any government services today has an SLA attached to it, right? A service level agreement. You know, you will get your tax return done in so many days. You should get a refund in X number of days. If you ask a question, you should get an answer in 15 days. You know, we never had that before. In a sense, a lot of this is a function of how we are thinking about governance in today's environment where everything is accessible all the time. So one is, that the SLAs will be a lot tighter. We'll be able to track them. And in fact, you can provide government services to people very quickly. And mm -hmm. if there's a problem, you can solve it for them. And they are not afraid of calling up to solve the problem. Right? I think that's the other part, which is today we, there is an ability for anyone in a village who is completely illiterate to video, uh, you know, to send a video complaint to the PM's portal using a small mobile phone that cost him or her 2,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. And it will be responded to, right? So that's one thing that technology is helping in terms of the structure of the government, uh, structure of governance, and how governance changes completely. I think the second thing is it is now becoming very possible for uh, our elected representatives and our bureaucracy to deal directly with the citizens. You go back and see how an MLA or an MP interacted with their constituents. And you look at how they are doing it today. You know, they are very clear that they are using the digital media. They're using SMSs, they're using technology, and they want an interactive engagement with their uh, constituents. Previously, that used to happen once in a while when you had a large rally or you're going for elections. Today, it is all the time. So I think that will change, the technology itself will help change the nature of governance and as I said, maybe we will get to the point where we will have a governance-centric citizens as opposed to citizen-centric governance. governance. Thank you. Thank you, Adit. Actually, let me take this point to Ambassador Nadeep Suri. Uh, uh, are we seeing increasingly because of the proliferation of communication uh, and ease of access to all of you, are we seeing diplomacy also being driven by a much larger cohort? You know, we always used to say foreign policy and economic policy are for the elites. Are you seeing a, a new democratization uh, that has taken place in terms of how uh, we are responding to certain events uh, and developments in the foreign domain? Absolutely. In fact, to take Adil's uh, argument on citizen-centric uh, uh, governance uh, uh, forward, um, look at the alacrity with which missions, uh, diplomatic missions, have to respond to tweets from citizens who are uh, facing some kind of consular or other problem in whichever part of the world. Uh, the fact that they can uh, be um, able to merrily tag our foreign minister or the prime minister or whoever else uh, and, and, and expect an answer uh, means that the, uh, the proliferation of social media uh, has become, in a sense, a tool of empowerment for the Indian diaspora around. Uh, and it has become a means of accountability uh, for a, a diplomatic missions. Uh, but you also increasingly see um, how uh, beyond the traditional uh, um, sort of influencers on government, uh, on foreign policy, be it think tanks, be it uh, 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 the media, uh, you have uh, politicians who are attuned to what people are saying on social media uh, on a particular policy initiative. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, while, while, while you can make the argument that leadership should not be driven by opinion, 
But the fact is that in a democracy, that opinion uh, uh, and that feedback loop that uh, social media creates uh, does become uh, uh, an input into uh, decision making and into uh, foreign policy processes. Now, it even starts to uh, impact uh, uh, sometimes bilateral relations. Uh, uh, if, if, for example, somebody has made a nasty tweet, uh, uh, take the case of last week uh, on the Abu Dhabi attacks and on something that the Saudis might have said, it quickly becomes an issue that escalates. Uh, and, and so we are watching it real time unfold before our eyes. Uh, and, and let me just remind the uh, audience that uh, Ambassador Nadeep Suri at one point was driving a larger engagement with the publics in terms of India's foreign policy when he was heading the public diplomacy division at the NEA. And I'm sure he would be happy with the, the new ecosystem that is fast emerging. Amrita, I know you need to leave, so I'm going to ask you the next question. Uh, let me just throw a curveball at you. Uh, as India and EU and India and the West reconfigure a value-based proposition for the future, do you think some of the institutions that were the no-goes for India, for example, NATO, uh, becomes a fair partner for the future? So uh, should we be uh, now uh, shedding the shibboleths of the past and in a sense uh, looking at uh, new avenues? And, and I, NATO is just an example. It could be other institutions as well. Uh, it could be a, a, a more deeper integration into the Basel processes, into the G7, into the G7 et cetera. I love the googly. Thank you. I think this is the spot on question and everybody just sort of skirts around it. Um, so I'll say it as I see it. And I, we have seen NATO adapting and updating, right? So uh, we had um, uh, Jens Stoltenberg give a distinguished speaker lecture at the Giga where he talked about the challenges that are being posed by China. Right. And he said, no, we don't see China as an enemy, but we do. And but he talked about values. He got talked about economic threats. He talked about security threats. If NATO can update a multi-member complicated organization can update to the China challenge, surely we in India can also think about shedding some of our uh I, th I think Raja is absolutely right. We're not talking the language of non-alignment, but maybe we can push ourselves a little bit more to go beyond just pragmatism and to say, well, we do have allies with shared values, right? And so I'm not expecting India to become a NATO ally, but India can certainly partner with NATO on a whole host of um, areas. So there are lots of measures, uh, there, are, there are lots of co um, cooperation arrangements that are short of a full-blown alliance. And we should certainly be thinking about this as well as other possibilities. Great, thanks Amrita and thank you for your intervention this uh, evening. Uh, Raji, let me turn to you uh, for your final question. And again, it's a curveball. Uh, what do you see is the role of uh, think tanks and the scientific and research communities uh, across uh, the emerging and developing countries um, in terms of building this new um, uh, ethic for the future. And this is for Dr. Rajeshwari Rajakopalan. Uh, if you heard me, Raji, uh, perhaps that's a question you could take. How can we in think tanks create deeper uh, linkages for the future? Yeah, I think policy uh, policy making has uh, shifted in many ways, and I think it's no more uh, restricted to the uh, you know four uh, four walls of the uh, MEA or MHA and MODN kind of places. Now that used to be the old base of uh, doing business policy business in a sense, but I think that has changed uh, significantly to engage a large number of stakeholders from uh, whether it is a private sector you're talking about or a think tank community, civil society. All of them have become an important aspect, uh, important um, stakeholder in the in the policy making business, and I think the think tanks have a particularly large role, uh, especially when you come to when it comes to policy communicate uh, policy conversations, uh, because on many uh, many number of issues, especially when you take up the issues of uh, critical and emerging technologies, uh, we are stuck at policy uh, policy governance policy issues. Uh, so when you are uh, when you face those diff uh, very diff difficult challenges of making uh, different state parties come together to uh, develop, uh, to come into the room, debate the pros and cons of certain uh, course of action, I think the best that you can do is to have think tank community, policy community, uh, engage in track 1.5 uh, mm -hmm. conversations, and I think uh, trying to bring in different stakeholders under the same roof. And I think that's an important aspect. Second is to, of course, the, uh, the policy options, the publications that 
uh, think tanks produce again has an enormous value. At least you are throwing different ideas for the government to think about. You don't have to, the government, uh, they don't have to necessarily accept and adopt everything that the think tank uh, writes or talks about. But at least you are throwing around different options and choices for the government to think about. And I think these are important uh, things that I think they, even Indian governments, uh, for instance, over the last uh, decade or two, um, has begun to appreciate the value of engaging think tanks uh, and so on and so forth. So I think the policy community has a has an important role to play, especially for sitting in the think tank world. I think there are uh, important contributions that uh, think tanks can make on, on a number of different issues, especially when, when it comes to policy uh, around technologies, because I think technology is an area where uh, uh, private sector think tank communities are somewhat more uh, adept in a sense in terms of the kind of challenges that we are facing, the kind of changes that we need to bring about, the kind of debates that we need to make it happen. Uh, so in a sense, uh, on these at least, uh, the think tank community may be slightly more at an advantageous place. And the ability to bring in uh, different states, different stakeholders through track 1.5 uh, sort of a deliberations, I think that's enormous uh, in value uh, in, in this regard. Thank you, Raji. Let me turn to uh, Dr. Raja Mohan for the final line this evening, for his final intervention. One question, answer uh, your thoughts as we close. The question to you is, uh, some would argue that in the last decade, the track one community, the policy community has been ahead of the curve and uh, the think tanks have been far more conservative. You know, uh, gone are those days that we, when we used to be the originators of dramatic ideas. I think the political class does it much better than us today. So uh, uh, how do we reinvent the policy thinking going ahead? How do we continue to be ambitious as, uh, as, as institutions? But uh, how do you sum up what you heard today and from the volume that we have co-produced uh, with all of you? So I'll just uh, briefly you know, state I mean, four or five things. I, mean, I think one, uh, what Adil Bhai talked about, the, the importance of technology, and then uh, what Amish started with India's relative weight going up in the international system. I think both these need to be combined to change the lives of our people. I, mean, I think that should be the first task of the state. So the internal, de accelerating internal development using both technology, as well as India's new international leverages, I think that's really the first uh, uh, proposition. The second, I think, is when we talk about it, India at 75, uh, India's independence tragically was also associated with India's partition. Uh, I think we didn't go too much into it, but I think the bitter legacies of partition, I think uh, they endure on a range of issues. Uh, I mean, from I mean, we don't have to go into the detail, but the fact is those legacies need to be addressed. I mean, I think that uh, that becomes very, very important. But the third aspect, I would say, uh, India began its foreign policy in 70, you know, 75 years ago with an emphasis on Asia, but we really didn't succeed. But today, I think two new geographies that have come, the Indo-Pacific, which is broader than Asia and the Indian Ocean, then you have Eurasia. On both these, with India's increased weight, today, I think we have a much better opportunity to shape both these regions. And I think how we do this uh, is, a, is, a, is an exciting venture. Uh, I think for all of the next generation of uh, policy makers. Then we, we also talked about rejigging the global order, both economic as well as uh, strategic, uh, rearranging multilateralism. Here, one of the new things that has happened is minilateralism. We briefly mm -hmm. mentioned Quad. So it's not just doing everything in Geneva or Vienna, but I think it is like-minded countries coming together and shaping the evolution, whether it's on climate change, or whether it is on uh, uh, digital rules, which you have worked quite a bit on that, uh, or even space, uh, for example, uh, many of these new domains, new rules are going to be written. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the Chinese exploration on moon, for example, uh, the American Artemis program. Who is going to write the rules for exploitation uh, of outer space? So I think we need to be a lot more actively involved in reshaping global domains. ORF has done a lot of work on space, on cyber. These issues uh, where India needs to more actively, positively participate to set new rules. So I think this is a, a rich agenda for us. And here I would say the last thought uh, that think tanks, there's always a danger of falling into group think. Mm -hmm. So what is conventional is, is great. So therefore don't challenge any. Uh, and then the second problem is let's stay 10 feet behind the governments mm. uh, so that you're not upsetting anyone or uh, you don't take any risks. It's easier to be, and it's not a problem in India. I mean, I would say, look at the US. Mm -hmm. uh, not one thing that 
Biden has done was predicted by any of the massive think tank industry in, in Washington. Uh, so I think it is not the size of it. A lot of people say, oh, Washington has fantastic industry, but they miserably failed to tell us about Trump. They have not told us about Biden. So I think there is the danger uh, of becoming, like in Washington, the revolving door, of course, people go in and come out. So you want to be in a bandwidth that will get you the next job. But I think the, the advantage of being in the think tank industry is to question the principle. It doesn't have to be adversarial uh, or critical always, but I think the ability to show alternative options Mm -hmm. which is what Raji was talking about. The scale of the policy-making challenges in India is so broad, mm -hmm. the government structure is not alone, you know, in, in a position to produce yes. those changes. So I think you already seen on climate change on a lot of issues where ORF itself has made major contributions. So I think there is a huge, exciting field for all those of us in think tanks uh, to, to contribute to policy-making, uh, not in, you know, as one thing, look, we don't want to be sitting inside the government and running things, but I think the role outside is going to be far more exciting in a way that we can bring together a lot more diverse inputs. But I would say for anyone, for the younger people, you have a large number of young people, I mean, today in India, for them, this is really an exciting moment. I think this is an India, this is not the India we grew up in. We were always defensive. We were always hesitant. But today, I think the opportunities for the new India are enormous. And uh, it's really going to be wonderful to be uh, representing India and dealing with dealing for India with the Western world. Thank you, Dr. Raja Mohan. I think those are important words. India at 75 and the future beckons. Um, and uh, the Gen Next is an opportunity to write uh, newer scripts and indeed uh, discover newer pathways for development, growth, and for their individual aspirations as well. Um, let me uh, thank all the panelists for their wonderful interventions. And let me turn it back to Amish, a, a wonderful host, for his final words as we close this evening. And my apologies, we ran five minutes uh, over our schedule. Amish, over to you. Thanks, Amish. This was a fascinating uh, discussion. I think the uh, the audience learned a lot. One could see from the participation and the questions. Uh, Samir, it's a fantastic volume that you put together. So if any uh, uh, member of the audience wants to get this uh, this uh, this book, this volume, uh, how can they source it? Uh, please come to our website. It's the banner volume. You just land on our website and download it. It's in PDF and in HTML format, www.orfonline.org. This is going to be up for the next um, uh, few days. Uh, please uh, uh, make full use of uh, the resource. Okay, so it's it's free of cost and royalty free as an author that truly scares me. Uh, but, it's <laughs> but it's wonderful. If we start having the viewership you get for your publication, we will probably think about pricing. But no, as a public <laughs> institution, all our material is available to all audiences. Well, it's, 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 uh, it was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Samir, for putting this together. Uh, Professor Raja, Adilji, Ambassador Suri, uh, Rajeshwiji, thank you so much for, uh, for joining this uh, platform. Uh, Amrita had to leave earlier, but I hope uh, she can hear us. Uh, thank you so much. This was a wonderful event and look forward to many more uh, such discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Republic Day. Happy Republic Day. Thank you.